Blessing to me, and uh, Barbara and I were talking about it. I just praise God that uh, you are here. You guys done all the work, though. Yeah. <laughs> I got to watch. We couldn't have done it without the that. extra help from you. Anybody guys. else? Yeah. yeah. I here. just would like to praise God for bringing us through another week and um, for answered prayer and for watching over us and for. Our the time that I'm getting to spend with my grandsons and um, enjoying the time with them and them being here in church with us this morning. And I also, Pastor, would like to lift up my mom and my sister. Um, my mom went, we took her back to Denver last week. She went to the doctor on <coughs> Friday and the doctors told her that she has no circulation from her hips all the way down to her feet mm -hmm. and that she's at high risk of having a stroke or a heart attack, so I just would like to lift up my mom. My sister went to the doctor as well, and they found uh, oh. she has a really bad infection in her stomach. It's called py pyre or something like that. I don't know the exact name of it. H pylori? Pylori. Yeah. Yeah. They give her that. Yeah. Yeah. Takes 10 pills and it's gone. Yeah. And most people. That's, yeah. I had that once in before I went to have my surgery on my lap band, and they give me 10 pills and never had a cent. Yeah, so, you can get rid of that. Okay. The circulation is another one. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else this morning? I just continue oh. to pray for Dion and, and my nephew and my niece and, and all those that are addicted to that uh, awful drug, that crystal. Yeah, that's not a good thing. Yeah, Mindy. I want to thank the Lord for healing your leg. Yeah, well, it's good, Nur. I praise Him for that. I'll tell you that. Right? Yeah, I'd like to thank the Lord for helping me to lose my weight. Yeah. Anybody else this morning? No? All right, Barb, you can take the kids. And uh, it may not be for a long service today, but it's, there's a lot of good stuff in here. So as we take a look at it, okay. Anyway, verse 1 says, Come down, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. 
Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and your corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Now, there's nothing wrong with being rich if you use the money right, if you pay your tithe and do things right, God blesses you. There was a gentleman, I can't remember his name, I didn't go back to find out what his name was. But I, but I knew it, but it's been a long time and I can't remember. There was a man who decided that he would pay 20% of his tithe. He had a business. He paid 20%. Pretty soon his business grew to it. He paid 30%. Then he paid 40%. Then he gave 50% of what he made to the church. And God blessed him over and over and over. He became a millionaire. Uh, and he, but he said that God told him to give his tithe. And every time he increased it, his business increased. Now, does that work for everybody? No. It don't work for everybody. But you will be blessed if you pay your tithe. That's for sure. And God will bless you for it. And that's important to understand. It. We don't preach about it too much down here because a lot of the guys, most of the people come through these doors here are not Christians. And the ones who are do a pretty good job of doing what they have to do. But most of them aren't. So I don't deal a lot with it, but we do talk about it because it's important. And the Bible says it's important. In Malachi, I think, chapter 3, chapter 4, it says, how can you rob God? Well, people don't think anything about robbing somebody else, but you better think about robbing God. Because if you rob God, he has a way of getting back at you. I'll tell you that right now. Now, you don't do it intentional. I mean, it's not an intentional thing. But you have, if, you don't, if you don't honor him, he can't honor you. And that's something that a lot of people have a hard time understanding. In a church of 150 people, about 40 to 50 of those people will pay their tithe. Maybe. And the rest of them don't. And so actually the rest of them are robbing God. That's what the Bible says. If you withhold your tithes and offerings, you're robbing God. And so, if you get used to paying your tithe when you're young, and you do that throughout, you're, you'll, you'll be blessed. And you'll continue to be blessed. And it's important to understand that. Now, uh, if you take a look at a lot of these people that have died in the past, and millionaires, have millions of dollars in the bank. Whitney Houston made, oh man, I don't know, 50, 60 million dollars and died a drug overdose. Her daughter, 22 I think she was, died a drug overdose. And Look at all the singers and all the all the rock singers and, and country singers that have died from drug overdoses. Have all the money in the world, and they're not happy with it. Anthony Bourdain. I don't. I never liked his language on television. Good cook. I never liked his language, but he, he would have, he'd have a smile on his face and everything would be cool. And he hung himself. You, he, if you're not happy inside, it don't matter what you have. You can be poor and be happy, and you can be rich and be happy. But it's harder for a rich man, it says it's harder for a rich man to make it to heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's pretty, pretty tough. But is there anything wrong with that? It's not with that, not with the concept of being rich if you do what God wants you to do. That's, that's what's important. And if that's one thing that we have to understand and lock it up in our minds. If you don't make money, the God, you're God. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people that money is their only thing that they go for. They go for as much as they can get. And today that we the day that we live in, today, it's gimme, gimme, gimme. Everything is gimme, gimme, gimme. And we we're not we shouldn't be in a gimme we should be in a give society, but not a gimme society. Because now it's now it's getting better because our unemployment rate nationwide now is three point nine percent, which is the lowest it's been in 20 years, I think, or 25 years. And that's pretty good. But it is going to get better because more people are getting off welfare, more people are working, and they're doing what they need to do. But it's a thing where we should have a drive. We should want to do that. We should want to better ourselves. And that's the one problem that I have in this place. When, the men are, when, the, when we have the shelter open and the men and women come in, they don't want to better themselves. They don't, now, some of them do, but the majority of them don't really want to better themselves. They'd rather live off the door. They'd rather have us feed them and give them a place to stay than for them to get out and work and do what they have to do. But that's our job and that's what we do. 
Now in verse 4 it says, indeed the, indeed the wages of the laborer who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Now, there are a lot of people that take advantage. I see that right down here. There's a lot of people that take advantage of people less fortunate. Years ago, I had a gentleman that he went out and he got batteries. He came down and he hired two men to help him load 150 batteries on the back of his truck. And when he got done, he gave them, I think it was a bottle of beer and five dollars. And I told him when he came back, I said, don't you ever come down here and get anybody again. Ever. Because I said, that, we don't, that don't cut it. That's just not right. And he never did come back. But I told him, I said, don't you ever come back here for that. Now, people that hire guys down here, a lot of them pay them good. And, and, and if they work good, fine. And if they don't work good, fire them. <laughs> that's, that's, it. that's what you do. And you don't have to hire them back again. But if they work good, fine. And, and a lot of guys do. But right now, we've got a bunch of guys that don't want to do anything. They don't want, they don't want to do nothing. All right. Verse 7. Now, therefore be patient, brother. Now we're talking to the Christian. Therefore be patient, brother, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until he receives the early and latter rain. You know, we was watching, what was the name of that movie we watched the other night? There is a guy. Heaven is for real. Huh? Heaven is for real. Yeah, heaven is for real. Uh, I never saw it before, but I watched it, and uh, the, the, there was a lot of family. The man was a preacher in a Wesleyan church, and uh, his his son was taken to heaven, and he was just a little boy, probably what four years old. Four years old, and now and a lot of it was based on truth. Yeah, yeah, and and a lot of that stuff I don't put a lot of stock in, but this little boy. Watched his dad go into a chapel and argue with God. And he watched his mother in another place from heaven. And he saw it. And he saw Jesus. And if, and I, if I'm not mistaken, a young lady thousands of miles away yeah, in, in, Europe. in Europe somewhere had, had the same experience. And she was an artist, so she drew a picture of what Jesus looked like. So the preacher, he was having a hard time with this. He said, I, I, I just can't believe it. And uh, then he said, I, I'll show my son pictures of Jesus. So he showed him a picture of Solomon's head of Christ. Nope, that wasn't him. Showed him another one. Nope, that wasn't him. And that girl in Europe who drew a picture of Jesus... When he put that picture up there, the little boy looked at it and he says, that's him. That's him. Now, I don't put a lot of stock in what a lot of people say about that stuff. But when it's a little kid, four years old, and he's sure of himself, and he saw what he, he explained, it, just what he saw. And his dad, his dad almost lost it, he almost lost his church. And everything because he had a hard time believing it himself. But when he saw that picture and he said, that's him, it changed him. And he, he was in his church and his church was full of people when, the, when, when he preached the, the sermon that he showed. And, but it's a thing where uh, out of the mouth of babies, we have, to, we have to pay attention. We have to pay attention. And I've seen a lot of stuff that I don't believe at all, period. But I have a, I have a tendency to believe that. Mostly because I went, I went to a, a West End church years ago. It's a good church. And they preach a good, a good doctrine. And they live it. And, and uh, I could see the doubt in the man's eyes. I could, you, could, you could see the doubt. And you would experience it yourself. 
If somebody came up to you and said, I saw Jesus, you'd say, yeah, right. You know? But there's been people that have got a vision of Christ. There's been people that have different things like that. And so, you know, that we have to understand that it can happen. But it says here, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. A lot of people have a problem with patience. And I would dare say that a lot of us right here today have a lot of problems with patience. Now I have patience in some ways, in some ways I don't. And, and down here, you know, it's part of my job and I don't, it nothing really bothers me. But going to all these doctors that I've been going to and going to all this stuff that I've been, that, that, I got to admit, I have to say, Lord, give me patience because I've never done that before in my life and, and uh, I hope I never have to again. But but uh, you got to pray for patience. And for people that are impatient, you need to pray for patience that God will give you patience because it's something that we all need. Do not grumble against one another, brother, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Do not grumble against one another, brethren. Churches in this valley, a lot of churches in this valley have split over the years. I've been here 36 years. And I've watched several of them split. And not one of them that I know of. There may be one church in town that splits off right. But I'm not going to go into that. But not one of the ones that I know of. They, did, they didn't split out of love. They didn't split out of kindness. They split because they grumbled and moaned and groaned and couldn't. They, had, they found fault with either the preacher, the church, the people, or something. And that's not the way God wants it to be. He wants us to have perfect harmony. He wants us to have harmony in the Word and to do what God wants us to do. It says don't grumble. Don't complain. You know, and that means you've got to get along with one another. You know, and that's, that's not easy sometimes. And sometimes we have to swallow our pride and say, hey, we'll do it the other way. It's just what we have to do once in a while. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. You know, I saw last night, and they, they, the skeptics that don't believe in Jesus, in the Bible, it, I didn't look it up where it was, but it's in the first in the, in the gospel. Uh, when Jesus called his, his disciples, three of them were from Bethsaida, and and they never could find Bethsaida. They couldn't they couldn't find. It. So everybody said it's not there. It's not there. Well, they've excavated a place on the Sea of Galilee that dates back to Bethsaida. They've got coins that date back to it. They've got pottery that dates back to it, and they've even got one coin that has the inscription and the and the face of the leader. I can't remember Nero, 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 Nero. and AD seventy. That was in AD seventy, and and so they and they know that it's Bethsaida, but there's another place underneath it that the Romans had. And you know, I the Bible says in the last days there'll be strange things we'll be finding. We'll be seeing things. And this is just God revealing to us that His Word is real. And that's important to understand. A lot of people today laugh at that. A lot of people say, oh, that's God's, He's not real. Yeah, He's real. He's real. And if you love Him and you trust Him and you obey Him, He'll bless you and He'll give you blessings beyond compare. But it's, a, it's something that we have to understand. Now, Indeed, we count them blessed to endure, who have heard the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, now, here's where Christians even have a hard time. And I have a hard time using that word when they use words that are not right. But we are not to swear. The Bible says, above all, above all, my brethren, 
Do not swear, either by the heavens or by the earth, or with any other oath. Let your yes be yes and your no, no. Just or lest you fall into judgment. We don't have to add anything to embellish what we say if our word is good. If you say yes, you're going to do it, you do it. And if you can't do it, you call them and let them know. And your word has to be good. You don't need to have the garbage that comes out of people's mouth today. Because what comes out of the mouth comes out of the heart. What's in your heart comes out of your mouth. And so if you've got garbage coming out of your heart, it's going to come out of your mouth. And it's going to affect people around you. It's going to take your witness, if you have a witness, it's going to take your witness and put it right down on the ground. People look at you, as a Christian, they look at you different. They expect you to be different. They expect you to be Christ-like. And if you're not, then that ruins, your, that ruins what you put out there. Because they say, we can't trust them. And it's important that we have that we understand that we have to live a life pleasing unto God. Now, this part here, the church does not do anymore. Sometimes uh, there's a few that do, but not very many. And that's why we have so much sickness in the churches today. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing song. You know, I got a we got a we got several grandkids, but we got a two year two and a half year old that uh, when she was just a baby, I'd hum to her. And every once in a while, I'd hear her. And she'd be humming along. And I, didn't, and I, I don't know what she's humming. I haven't figured that one out yet. But she's humming. And, and uh, you know, you sing it. You sing when they're little. And they, Connor goes to bed every night, almost every night, with my CD playing. Every night. Every night. And he goes to bed with that CD playing. And I said, you ought to have all them songs memorized by now. He says, I get to sleep by the third song, Grandpa. <laughs> but, but I said, you ought to have all the songs memorized by now. But it's the thing where if you raise your kids up right, you have to trust God that they'll do what's right. And that's what's important. And everybody has problems. I don't care who it is, we all have problems. How we deal with those problems is the key. How we deal with them. And we have to learn to reason the Bible says, God, let us reason together. And sometimes we need to have fellowship one with another. We need to have the fellowship of the brother. Because it's important. It's important to be able to pray one for another when you're sick. It's important to lift one another up when you're doing good. I mean, when you're down or when you need help. It's important for that. But it says, if any, and I'm going to read this again. If, there's, if anyone is sick among, among you, let him call the elders of the church. Let them pray over them, anointing him with oil. In the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, when I had this, I broke my leg. I was in the hospital, and the Lord laid it on my heart and said, "Call, call this right preacher, you know, and tell him to bring the oil and come in and anoint my foot." So he come in. I had this boot on, and he says, "What are we going to anoint?" Well, I didn't have a sock on. I said, my big toe's right there. Go ahead and anoint my big toe. And he laughed. He said, well, that's part of your foot. I guess we can do it. And so they, he prayed over it. And I said, okay. We've done what, we, what the Bible said to do. But the Bible says to call the elders of the church, let them anoint them with oil, and the prayer of faith will save the sick. And if he has committed any sins, they will be forgiven him. We went to Salt Lake City and preached down here one time. And I mentioned that. And the preacher came up afterwards and he said, you're wrong. And I said, what about? He said, the Bible don't say what you said. And I said, what did I say? He said, well, where it says, is anybody among you sick, let him, let you know, let's read this again. If, anybody, if, if anyone among you is sick, let him call the elders of the church. Let them pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now here. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. He said, I believe that, but the rest of it is not there. I said, you go and take your Bible tonight, and you look at it, and you're going to see it's there. Now, i got to give him credit. The next morning when he came in for Sunday morning, he said, you were right. He said, it's there. I never saw it before. See, we read sometimes, and we don't see what we read. We have to pay attention to what we read. Confess your trespasses one to another. 
and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, we don't confess our faults one to another because we have a hard time trusting one another. You don't go to somebody you don't trust and tell them your innermost part of what's going on in your mind. You just don't do it. And it's hard enough for people that are friends to even carry somebody else's burden. But the Bible says we are to lift one another up in prayer. We are to confess our trespasses one to another that we may be healed. That's how the healing takes place. That's why we have so much strife today. Because people will not listen. They want to put their, their ideas forward, but they don't want to listen to anything else. Listening is a hard thing. You, have, you almost have to train yourself to listen. Because the natural reaction is, is to just, boom, go forward with what you got in your mind. And so we have to learn to listen. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man of Bill's mind. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And that's something that's important. When we see, if we see a brother in error or sister, we should be able to go to that person and talk to him and reason with him, not find fault with him, not look down on him, but say, "I want to help you. I want to help you." And but today, I was thinking about that this morning. Years ago, in the church, people would walk up to somebody, even in the service. And they say, God laid it on my heart to pray for you. And they do it right there. Or they, sometimes they go to the altar and pray. We don't see that anymore. It don't happen. Because people are afraid they're going to hurt somebody's feelings. Or they're, gonna, they're afraid they're going to offend somebody. But you're never going to offend anybody with the word of God. And if you do, they got a problem. It's not yours. It's not his. Because, you know what, before, when I was about 16 years old, 15, 16 years old, I just gave my heart to God, and I used to have a gentleman that would meet me at the front of the door of the church, and he'd say, are you saved? And I used to try to hide from him. I'd see him come, I'd, I'd try to get away from him. And after I got my heart right with God, I found him, I walked up to him, I said, I'm saved. And he said, good, I won't have to pray anymore for that. And never had another, way. Well, I mean, we'd say hello or something like that, but that was about it. But it's amazing how when you're not doing it right, you want to get away from them. When you're doing it right, you want to go to them. And that's the way it should be. Love, we love your neighbor. What? As yourself. As yourself. And that's the problem we have today is we have a problem loving one another. We have a problem lifting one another up. And, and we need to do that. It's something that we have to do. And, you know, the I was, I was thinking... I don't live in the past. I'm not a person who lives 50 years in the past. But the church was different 50 years ago. It was. It was It was completely different. And you'd see things. I saw things 50 years ago that I doubt I'll ever see again. Unless the Lord really pours His Spirit out upon America. I don't know with what we got in America today. I, I, I hope that God gives us a revival. But I don't know if it's coming or not. We, we, we turned our back on, I believe we turned our back on God when Madeline Murray O'Hare had prayer taken out of school. Now, a lot of people, the kids today, that they go out and march and they, and they want guns taken out because guns kill people, but guns don't kill people. I've got five guns in my house and not one of those guns have killed one person, nor have they shot one person. Nor will they ever shoot one person. As long as they're where they're at. What, what kills the person is the evil that's in the mind of the young person or the older person that goes in and does the damage that's done. 
That's what does it. It's the same way as some men that come in this place that have been on, they're on parole, they're on probation, they've done things that are contrary to the law, and they have to pay a penalty for it. Well, there's a lot of people that, if you get into their life, I, I see the life of a lot of the guys that come in here, I, I've talked to a lot of them over the years, and their grandparents were in trouble, their parents were in trouble, their brothers and sisters were in trouble, and they got in trouble. And it was a generational curse. The Bible talks about it. It's a generational curse that goes right straight back down the line. And the only way that you can break that, I don't care what anybody says, and the pro officers don't believe it, and I've talked to them, several of them, but the only way that you can break that is by getting your heart right with God and doing what the Bible says, go and sin no more. That breaks that generational curse. And that's the only way you can do it. And that sets the prisoner free. That sets that person free. And when you're free from sin, you're free indeed. The blacks used to have a thing. For I, we're free, and I'm free, what is it? How do you go? I'm free, I'm free, I'm free indeed. Free at last. Free at last, free at last yeah. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. And that's, that was a good statement. The statement was good. But the real meaning of that is in the Word. When the Bible says in John chapter 3, it says, sin is lawlessness, and lawlessness is sin. If you don't break the law, you don't, you're not condemned by the law. If you don't break God's law, you're not condemned by God's law. And so therefore, when you don't break God's law, you don't break man's law, means you're living right with God. Now, do you have to have your heart right with God? Yes, you do. Do you have to repent? Yes, you do. Because the Bible says without repentance, there is no remission of sins. So we have to repent of our sins, ask Christ to come into our life, and change us, and make us what he wants us to be. And when we do that, then we're living where God wants us to be. Now, I want to close in prayer today. I want to pray for Mary's family, and for your mother, and for your sister. Any other prayer requests today? Can you have anybody at all? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I pray for that every day. <laughs> Any, anybody else? No? Okay. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Father, we come before you today. We thank you, Lord, for all you do for us. We thank you for touching us and healing us and, Lord, just saving us and change, giving us a new a new beginning. And, Lord, for anybody that's here today, Lord, that don't know you, we pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will work in their hearts, open their hearts up to you, and, Lord, uh, do a job in their life that only you can do. Clean them up and give them a clean heart between you and them. And, Lord, they'll have a witness then from now on, from that point on. And Lord, we pray this morning for Mary's mother. Pray, Lord, that you touch her and, and just uh, work in her life. And Lord, uh, neuropathy is a bad thing for a lot of people. And Lord, we just pray that you'll be there and help the doctors to do whatever they can do. But you're the chief doctor and you can touch her body and, and help her along that line. And we ask you to do that. And mostly, Lord, help her to get her life straightened out with you. And Lord, with her sister, Mary's sister, we pray for her, Lord, that you touch her and heal her. And Lord, uh, I don't know her situation, but Lord, if she don't know you, help her to get her heart right with you too. And Lord, for Dion, we pray, Lord, that you touch him. And Lord, we know you know that he's on drugs and that's a, a curse from the, demon, from, the, from the devil. And Lord, we ask you to work in his life and help him to get straightened out where uh, his life will be worth something that's worth a lot to his family. But if right now it's not worth a lot to him here, he wouldn't be taking these drugs. And so, Lord, we ask you to just work in his heart and change his life. We ask you, Lord, to give us a good week this week. Help us, Lord, to draw closer with you and to live a life pleasing unto you. And be with us this week as we go about your business. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, Keith, we didn't say happy birthday. to you. Happy birthday, dear Barbara. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. What's that, 78? Close. <laughs>